Michael Kitts and I have become kind of friends and he has themed based days where, okay, I'm doing this all day today. These are internal meeting days. These are client meeting days. This is content creation days. You have very, very specific themes and that works. And he has ADD too. So I think it's a huge trial and error process, but you have to be intentional around it and getting your model week down first and then filling in your team's model weeks around what works best for you. Welcome Model FA's David DeSell here, CEO of Model FA and your host of the Model FA podcast. And we are joined today by Libby Grywe. And you may know Libby by her name, of course, or you may know her as the efficient advisor. And I will say we are both uh, extremely, uh, call it passionate, busy, and uh, try our best to be incredibly productive people. So this is a long time coming. Uh, we've had this on the books for quite a while now, and I've been very excited to have Libby on. So with that being said, welcome to the show. Hey, I'm so excited to be here. So how'd you get started? You know, were you involved in the industry before getting into uh, the coaching consulting side of things that you're doing now? Like what was the uh, sort of birthing point, so to speak, of uh, getting exposed to the industry. Yeah, absolutely. So I had kind of your very traditional path. I went to school for engineering physics, then went into sports marketing for the Cincinnati <laughs> Reds, and then ended up in finance. So kind of your usual path. <laughs> <laughs> well, I very much appreciate the uh, dry sense of humor because you did have me for a second. I was like, I was like, oh, maybe you started at a broker dealer and then you broke off on your own. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no, no. I so I did start my financial planning practice with a broker dealer right when I graduated from university. So I started my business when I was twenty three, 22, 23, right out of school. So I originally went to school for engineering physics, realized I was way too extroverted to be a physicist while I liked the numbers and the analytics and that side. Um, you know, I actually liked humans and interacting with them. So it, this ended up being a really good combination for me being able to take those skills, but also be able to really utilize my interpersonal skills as well. Very nice. And how long were you at the broker dealer for before your next step and what was your next step? Yeah. Yeah. So I started my practice in 2004 and was like any other advisor, right? Those first four years working around the clock, like a crazy person building my business. I had a really, really exceptional start in the business, uh, you know, as qualifying for like our top conference, if you're familiar with broker dealer terms, right? I was qualifying mm -hmm. for our top conference in the second year. I was having a grand old time and then found out I was pregnant, which was great because my husband and I wanted a baby, <laughs> but not so great when I realized that I had just been, that there was no way it was sustainable. I was on the fast track to burnout and I could definitely not show up like the mom that I wanted to be while, you know, doing what I was doing. So I knew that I had built this really great business, or at least what I had thought was a business. And it turns out I had a Libby. I just had a Libby doing all of the things all of the time. It was not sustainable. Uh, I was the, the thing doing the thing. If I didn't show up, nothing got done. And so set out on a mission really over the next three, four years to go from working, you know, 70, 80 hours a week down to where I ultimately landed and finished pretty much my entire career was uh, at a 24 hour work week. So three days a week. So I could be fully present for my kids, for my, uh, for my husband, for my family, for my friends and have a full life outside of the, outside of the business without sacrificing the success and the revenue and the stuff that I really, really wanted from the business. And so I promise I have a point here. So <laughs> that kind of turned into this mission to really build an efficient model. And my broker dealer at the time started taking me and, you know, saying, okay, well, we're, you know, they were trying to hire more younger advisors, especially women. And they were trotting me around the country and having me speak all over. And I found that I just loved sharing with advisors that there was a much better way and that you could be a fully present parent. And it wasn't this hustle culture that when I started, especially at the conservative broker dealership that I was at, you know, it was a, if you want to make more, you have to work more mentality and you had to hire your wife and, you know, just hmm. this kind of old school methodology and that there was a better way. And so we started speaking all over the country. I started sharing the processes that we had built and other advisors 
started having crazy good success with it. And I found that I, you know, I loved giving them the thing and just saying, well, here's what I did. You take that and make it your own and watch these advisors modify it to work for all different types of businesses serving different demographics and different geographic locations with different team sizes and different markets. And it was just so cool to see people then sending me notes a year later saying, I have literally doubled my revenue and I'm working half as much as I used to. And so back in 2014, that's when the efficient advisor actually became a thing. So it started as kind of a side business within mm -hmm. my planning business where I just started coaching advisors and helping them build out more systems and processes so they could take back their lives. Now, so I have a bunch of follow-up questions, but my first one is, did you have to spend much time thinking about uh, the business name or was that just kind of obvious because that's what you were speaking about? <laughs> 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 yeah, you know, that's a great question. It feels so long ago now. I'm like, where did that come from? But yeah, that was really kind of the brand was around this idea. And what I heard from advisors over and over is, I know I'm not being very efficient with my time. I know I'm not being very efficient with my time. And so that was really kind of the difference with what I wanted to do from what I saw around me in the coaching space was I didn't want to focus on mindset and goal setting and all of those things that are really, really important. I wanted to be the person that was going to step in and say like, here's the nuts and bolts, like the soup to nuts. Here's how you build a process to actually take all of those big ideas and actually be able to implement them quickly, right? So more along the lines of an implementation side of things. So that's kind of where, where that name came from. Understood. Now, what do you, what are your thoughts? Because I love the idea of working, just call it half the time and, and making double, right? If we mm -hmm. just kind of keep that general statement in mind. Um, but like part of me also believes that at the beginning, like when you're brand new, like you have to pay your dues for lack of a better way to put it. And get to a point to where, cause I, I view, I think there's a difference between your time in the business and your exposure to the business, mm -hmm. right? So hypothetically speaking, let's just say in this made up example, um, you tend to have, you know, 10 client meetings or, or prospect meetings a week, let's just say hypothetically. Mm -hmm. Well, if you can have 20 prospect meetings in a week, you're doubling the exposure, you're, you're cutting in half the amount of time it takes you to kind of develop your skill set. And you're essentially, if you think of 10 prospects a week as over the course of a year as a year, and the alternative is 20 prospects a week over a year, it's kind of like you're working two years in one year, right? Because mm -hmm. you're exposing yourself to more of the business. So do you think that there's for lack of a better, better way to put it, like a requirement for the first year or two or three, or I think for you, it was like four years where it's like, you got to work your butt off and put in a lot of time and effort to then kind of earn the uh, right, for lack of a way to, better way to put it, to then be more efficient? Or do you think that you can start off right off the bat being efficient? What are your thoughts on that? So a little bit of both, right? So uh, my, the advisors that are kind of in my sweet spot, the ones that I do my best work with are typically the advisors who've been at this three, four years, maybe even longer, but are running themselves ragged, right? They've built this business. Everything that they prayed for is coming true. And they've built this business and they found that this business that they were dying to have is now in control of them. And they're tethered mm. to their phone on the weekends and they're checking email during soccer games and it's sort of taken over. And while it's a blessing, they never stepped back to actually build the business. And then I sometimes have advisors who come to me and I'm like, look, you have to have clients in order to put through these processes. Like you do have to have some experience under your belt to know kind of what your DNA is as a planner and what is your process? What's the type of planning that you like doing? Is it a three-step process? Are you doing it this way or are you doing it that way? Like you have to have some semblance of what you want to do as a planner. Like what's the service offering that you're wanting to give to the clients? What's the experience you're wanting to give your clients? And some of that comes through 
experience. Now, I also kind of, and maybe this is an unpopular opinion, but early in my career, you know, it was all about the numbers, right? I had the managers breathing down my neck saying, you got to see this many people because you got to put the reps in, you got to get the muscle memory, you got to do the thing. And what I found with that, and so maybe where I disagree a little bit with that notion is that sometimes I was putting reps in and doing, you know, doing the work with people who were totally not qualified to do any, I I wasn't actually growing or learning because I wasn't moving them further along the process. I was just practicing the same thing over and over and over, which was figuring out who was a crappy client or Mm -hmm. who wouldn't be a good fit to go through the process. Or I was actually teaching myself like, okay, well, if you can say the right thing and give them the right arm twist, then they'll cut, you know, and that's really genuinely not how I wanted to build my business. So pretty early on, I actually kind of let a lot of that go and said, I'd actually rather really focus on seeing fewer people and getting really, really deep and digging in and spending more time on the people who are actually moving through the process and getting really, really good at the next step and the next step and the next step and having the time, space, and energy to dive into all of those pieces and learn and educate and call peers and colleagues and find out more information versus just putting in the reps in and that early stage, which I was already actually pretty good at. Yeah, I think there's there's value in the reps, like in the first, call it like three to six months, because like you don't know what you don't know. And and honestly, it's I think it's better to practice your language and your process on folks that may not be qualified anyway. So you don't mess up like the real deal for one, sure. yes. um, but maybe yes. not for four years or, or whatever the time frame was until that inflection point happened. But I kind of had this aha moment as you were going through that, where a lot of folks in the independent space can look at the broker dealer space and be turned off because it's more of a sales oriented culture, Mm -hmm. generally speaking. And that's true in terms of like the managers and leadership breathing down your neck, hitting certain metrics. But I also feel like, and the aha moment I had is it's, it comes off as salesy when, as you put it, uh, something to the effect of like, when you're trying to twist someone's arm to move Mm -hmm. forward, that shouldn't be moving forward because they're not qualified. Whereas whether you're in the broker dealer space or you're in the independent space or hybrid uh, in between, I feel like as long as they're qualified, it's more of a consultative process to see if it's a fit to work together and less so sales. I, again, I'm just kind of making sense of this in my mind live Mm -hmm. here, but I feel (laughs) like the salesiness comes from trying to fit a square peg into a round hole, so to speak, uh, with unqualified folks, you know, trying to make them clients. Yeah. And I was really, you know, coming into the business right when, especially the broker dealer I was at was making that shift from being a sales organization to doing comprehensive financial planning. I mean, believe it or not, that was like new and fresh when I was, when I was getting started and it just made so much more sense to me with that engineering brain is, Hey, I need to know where we're going and where you want to end up so I can reverse engineer it into what the steps are that you need to be taking now in order to get there. And so I think that's worked very quickly, that environment of having quotas and numbers and things and like, hey, do this and do that from people who frankly had never built the business that I was looking to build. Uh, You know, I quickly kind of eliminated some of that and started focusing on quality um, and efficiency and effectiveness. Because even being efficient is great, but not great if it's not effective, right? And then it's not great if it's efficient and effective and if it's not enjoyable. So it really needs to be all three. Cool. Um, I want to take a hard right turn because I think it would be helpful. Great. Um, great. <laughs> so for uh, some of the moms that are listening to this, um, and I think we need more uh, women and, and moms in the industry just in general, but for the folks who are listening to this, um, how is it being a mom and running the business? Like what, what are some of your uh, tips and tricks and things that you do to remain being present uh, while also continuing to serve the clients that you serve? Like how do you strike that balance or that blend, if you will, uh, between being a mom and running a business? Because I, I'm not a mom, so I, I wouldn't know how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, I have such a love-hate 
relationship with this question. I get asked a lot and I've been on a lot of panels, you know, with uh, <laughs> sitting there with all my white, middle-aged, partially balding men. And I'm the only one that gets asked this <laughs> I'm question. Not there, right? I'm not there yet. <laughs> no, I'm no, not, no. You're, if you you're still listening in your to prime, the audio, David, you are in your yet. prime. <laughs> <laughs> no. And so I have a love-hate relationship with this because I know there are a lot of moms who are in this industry that, uh, you know, I, I get all the time comments like mom goals and, you know, that kind of stuff, which I love. And at the same time, I really don't think it's any different than being a dad, right? And then being a dad mm. of young children. Like, I don't know that women need to approach it any differently than men. However, I do also recognize that, especially, so I am 41. So I recognize, especially for my generation, I'm an elder millennial, that we still carry a lot of the mental load inside of relationships and households. And so as much as I wish I could sit here and say, well, pff, the way I do it is not any different than any of my male counterparts. That wouldn't be in earnest, right? Because I know it actually is. And so for me, it was really getting to a place or what kind of grounded me in my motherhood and my business was getting really, really clear on what I wanted both of them to look like. Like what does being a really present mom actually look like and mean. And then as kind of a business owner, you know, when I would hold my CEO days and I do my thing, that was one of my assessments. So it's little stuff like, okay, I want to be the mom that volunteers at school. And I was volunteering at school and I was the hallway math mom and I was doing <laughs> hallway math. Right. And I'd see my kid for like two minutes and then I'd see, you know, 13 other kids that I didn't really care for. Cause they're not mine for their th three or four minutes, you know? And I remember asking my sons one time, like, Hey, if mom's at school volunteering, what is it that you want me to do? And they're like, we want you at the parties. And I was like, party mom. Yep. I can do that. <laughs> right. And so like reassessing, like, well, is this, am I doing this because this is actually what's bringing me joy as a mother, or am I doing it because it's what I should be doing? Or I, I said, I wanted to be involved at school and kind of taking that and double clicking and saying, well, what does that really look like? What does being involved at school really look like? What's the next layer of that? Well, I want to be involved in school so I can actually spend time with my kids inside of their classroom experience. So it really kind of spending time, like identifying, what do I want to look like as a mom? What do I want to look like as a CEO of my business? And then how do I build a business that allows me to be 100% mom when I'm at home and 100% business owner when I'm at the office? Because what I had for a long time was this big old mishmash where I was doing home stuff while I was at the office and thinking about the kids and trying to manage some of that stuff. And then I was at home trying to like handle cell phone calls and uh, emails. And like, I was just a big old mishmash. And it was really, how do I build out a model week for myself that allows me to be fully present wherever I am instead of partially present with everything all the time. So bringing it back, and that's helpful, um, bringing it back to both moms and dads to just, let's say advisors. Okay. Um, Thank you. <laughs> I, know, <laughs> um, I know that for us at Model FA, like there's two like main sleeves of, of what we do. Um, we provide coaching uh, for growth oriented advisors and we provide uh, marketing strategy and we do all the things that come as a result of that marketing strategy from websites all the way down to creating a one pager and everything in between. Um, and if someone were to ask me like, Hey, from a marketing standpoint, like what are the top things that you come across that advisors need to fix or the top challenges uh, that they experience. And from a, a growth standpoint on the coaching side, like, Hey, what are the top things that advisors are struggling with? It's like, boom, boom, boom. Like it's, it's, there's some nuances here and there, but generally it's all the same stuff um, mm -hmm. with what you help folks with in becoming more efficient. What are the, some of the top quick hit things that they're struggling with and mm -hmm in an effort to give them something that perhaps can be implemented as a result of listening to this podcast, what's like a, a hint towards a solution for each of those points that, that you can come up with? Yeah. So probably the biggest problem that I see with the advisors that are in kind of my sweet spot is that they are just all day, every day in the friggin' tornado that is their business, right? Everything's on fire. They're on fire. Every, you know, there isn't a lot of time for them to actually step back and think about 
the business. Like they, everyone says, Hey, I want to work on the business. And it's like, well, where do I find the time to work on the business? I'm so busy being in it. And so my, the first thing that I like to do is really get those processes that exist. We're all doing, there's kind of seven core processes that every single business financial planning business has. And it's really whether or not we're doing with them with intention or not, in a, or in a way that's scalable or not. So the vast majority of these advisors have a process that they're following, whether they know it or not is a totally different thing. Hmm. Um, but they're winging it every time. It's not documented. It lives in their head. It lives in their assistant's head. And they sometimes skip steps. They customize too much. Like we, they just don't have like, this is our hard line process that we follow each and every time so that they can document it so that they can teach somebody else to do it so that they can scale it. So what I'm hearing uh, without using these exact uh, words or without you saying these exact words is um, creating standard operating procedures. And the only way that you can do that is if the uh, operating procedure is standardized uh, as opposed to, because I, I see this all the time too with advisors is we make a lot of different promises to a lot of different people on the front end. And then you have to fulfill on those promises and they're different for everyone. So therefore it's tough to document it. And I find oftentimes it's less so that they're because like there'll be times where I'm like, all right, well, pull up your calendar, but like, let me see what you have going on. And it's like, you look at it and you're like, you have a lot of time. Right. <laughs> and it's like, what you, you say you're busy, but like, unless you don't have any, you know, certain things on your calendar, like, what are you doing with it? So I feel like it's less so the reality of time and more so a depletion of energy because they're doing so many different things and therefore they get that feeling of busy. Do you find that to be true as well? Oh, 100%. And, and I think then our natural tendency is, okay, well, I'm so busy. I clearly have, you know, I, I always kind of hear it like, oh, I have the $20 an hour tasks that I shouldn't be doing and I should give those to somebody else and they hire somebody. And then they're just kind of like, waiting till the wheels fall off, they hire somebody and then they don't have standard operating procedures or anything for them to kind of follow. So they're just kind of teaching it. And really, so for me, I'm always like, you have to scale yourself first. And that comes from starts with time management. So like if I could teach advisors anything. Uh, so when we used to host like two day workshops in our office where advisors from all over the country would come in and my team and I would train them on our processes. If I, you know, cause I, I thought about like, okay, Here's all the things I want to teach advisors, right? It's huge. My arms are very, very wide right now for those of you that can't see me. And then I think, okay, well, what if I had a month? What would I teach them, right? I could teach them these things. What if I only had two weeks? What if I had a week? What if I had two days, right? And how do we get to like, what are those core processes that advisors need to put in place in order to move the needle the quickest? And then I got down to what if I only had one day? What if I only had one hour, right? So when I first started doing keynote speaking, I was like, what can I teach people in an hour? And if I had to pick one thing, it would be building a model week and really starting to manage yourself and then scale yourself first before you bring other people into the mix and start documenting those processes so that they can take them over. No employee wants to walk into an environment where they feel like every single day they're walking into something that's a burning building and there is no clear path for them. There is no clear, here's what I need you to do. Here's the expectations of your role. Here's the goals of your role. Here's how we know if you're meeting those expectations or exceeding them. And here's how you can grow within my business. It's very much like, ah, oh, I need an assistant. I need help. And I got to give them these things. And it's sometimes it's not even the right things that they're giving away first. So follow-up question to that kind of going to put you on the spot, do like a pseudo Love it. Uh, coaching, Love it. coaching it. session. So, <laughs> um, I, I think I'm actually very busy, not just like energy, you know, depleted at times. Like mm -hmm. most of the time my energy isn't depleted because I'm thoroughly enjoying the various things I'm doing, but like, so on my calendar, um, you know, and if I could share this in a podcast way, um, I'd, I'd share it, but I got all my client names and whatnot on there. So I'm not going to do that, but, um, you'd see it and be like, holy moly. <laughs> uh, exactly there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff on there, but mm -hmm. like I schedule my wake up time, mm -hmm. my gym time, mm -hmm. um, 
a little bit of a psychopath. So my cold shower time, uh, my flex time, my kind of behind the computer work time. Um, and then I smush all my client and prospect meetings between like 10 and four. So like the first part of the day is for me, secure my mask first uh, before helping others. And then it's doing all the stuff behind the computer. And then from 10 to four, give myself up to other humans, you know, be it clients and prospects. After four, usually it's a walk or a run or a bike ride just to kind of like reset everything, mm -hmm. um, you know, and uh, hang out with my wife, uh, maybe do a, another 30, maybe 60 minutes of work. And then by, you know, six, 630, like done for the night. Um, and then the other thing I do is, um, I try my best unless there's like a scheduling conflict slash an open time slot, only record podcasts on Thursdays and Fridays. So short of like using the restroom, um, I schedule absolutely everything. And then what I do at the end of every day is if there's any white space in my calendar, um, like open slots, I'll put in not like prep work. No, I won't put in that. I'll do like prep Libby's whatever, mm -hmm. right? Very, very specific. So I'm curious to know, my question is like, what are your thoughts on that? Is that what it should be? Is that overkill? Are there any like quick tips that you have? And then my part two to that question is, should I be separating things where it's like, hey, Mondays is all internal, no client meetings. And then you have client meetings Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then Friday is all internal. Like, should I be compartmentalizing the day or compartmentalizing? Like these are client days. These are sales days. What are your thoughts given what I tried to make a good overview of the way I operate my calendar just yeah, as a real absolutely. life example. So with your 27 point question, I will dive in. So <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. I, uh, I was on the coaching call with someone. Um, and one of the things that we helped them with is, uh, Dan Allison's methodology, uh, feedback marketing. And he asked three questions at once. And my feedback to him was, Hey, ask one question at a time. So thank you for the nice reminder that I need to practice what I preach. <laughs> oh no, I'm here for it. So I'll just, I'll just monologue here for a bit. You let me know if I forget part of it. So at the end of the day, it's whatever works for you, right? Like uh, your energy levels and when you peak and your peak productivity time is going to look totally different than mine based on your personality, your, the way you operate, how much sleep you get, your, what your other rhythms are inside of your life in addition to work. So for me, right, I get, I, I do all of my morning routine, if you will now in the afternoon, because my peak productivity time is actually like first thing in the morning after I get my kids off to school, like that window of time for me now, where it used to be, you know, it has just had to modify over the years as my kids have changed in age and they used to sleep in later. And now they go to school at the crack of dawn and I have to drive them versus riding the bus and all the things. So it's just going to look different depending on who you are. Um, the level of structure that you have is similar to kind of how I do things. I like to be very specific. I have ADD. I cannot sit down and have like little windows that are just like prep time, right? Because then it's like, mm, uh, by prep time, I mean YouTube or, you know, other mm. shiny objects, even though I know I'm supposed to be prepping, having to be very specific about what I need to accomplish during that window of time. And the more structure for me personally, the more structure I have, the more freedom I actually have. Mm -hmm. You know, when I first started this entrepreneurial journey, I was like, I am an entrepreneur. I can sleep till noon and stay up till 4 a.m. and get my work done at midnight if I want to and sleep in on Saturdays. And I had all the quote unquote freedom of the world, but I wasn't actually getting anything done. And, you know, as soon as I had the nothing makes you delegate better than a baby, uh, as soon as I had <laughs> kids, all of a sudden I was like, oh, wait a minute, the more structure I have, the actual more freedom I have. Like, you know, I sometimes will go through my schedule and show people kind of what I was doing and they'll go, I could not sustain that five days a week. And I said, that's why I did it. I didn't, right. I only was doing it three days a week so that I could have the freedom on Wednesdays and Fridays to play doggy on the floor with my kids. Right. So the structure actually gave me freedom. Now, the, the one thing I see a lot of people who are trying to build structure inside of their calendar, if they're not hyper-structured people, or even if there are hyper-structured people, is they spend so much time 
on the calendar that could actually be spent towards doing other things, right? Like they get so granular with, okay, then I can do this and then I can do this. And then I can, you know, drink my coffee, but I only have two minutes to drink it. And then I'm going to, you know, and then I'll pour the creamer in. Like you can get really, really intense yeah. with it. So like for me, I like for me, I would look at your morning routine and I'd just be like morning routine and it's 45 minutes versus like this, then this, then this, then this. But I'm also a huge fan. I love checking things off. I love crossing things off to do lists. So like if I can have five or six things that I can check off right away and it makes me feel really productive and puts me in a good tone for the day. Awesome. So I'm not sure if I, I if I covered all 27 points, but I think it's really something 27 and a half. 27 and a half. You yeah. have to customize and reiterate your schedule all the time. I think the model week that I landed on in my business. So I ran my practice. I sold it after 16 years. And in year 16, I had been running the same model week for maybe a year and a half. Right. So it just had to continue to be reiterated. Um, the other, Oh yes. I have remembered one of the other 27 points is, uh, you know, so some people like working in those theme days and it depends. So like for me, I felt client meetings were a lot like a performance. And if I did nine in a row, right, I would be exhausted. Like I energy wise couldn't sustain that for an entire day. So I had to sprinkle them over a couple of days. So if you can have a whole day that's internal and you're doing all content and creative work and you can do that with your brain awesome. But my brain never worked like that. So like, I, you know, Michael Kitsis and I have become kind of friends and he, that's kind of how he operates is he has themed based days where, okay, I'm doing this all day today. These are internal meeting days. These are client meeting days. This is content creation days. This is my writing time, you know, very, very specific themes and that works. And he has ADD too. Um, and that works for him. So I think it's really a huge trial and error process, but you have to be intentional around it and getting your model week down first and then filling in your team's model weeks around what works best for you. Understood. And that that's helpful. And I was hoping there was two main things that you said that I was hoping you were going to say, which is it's not a one size fits all. Um, and it needs to be, uh, recalibrated um just like a a morning routine or for for you an afternoon routine needs to be recalibrated and if it's no longer serving you um just because you set out to do that a year ago or six months ago or two years ago it doesn't mean you have to keep doing that we have um we bring folks through um uh, an energy audit so it's mm -hmm. a, a play off of uh Stephen Covey's time management quadrant. Yes. So it's like things that you love to do and you're great at, uh, things that you like to do and you're good at, things that you don't like to do, but you're still good at, and then things that you uh, don't like to do and you're bad at. And we have them go through that energy audit to figure out just a snapshot of like, where should you be spending the majority of your time, i.e. in the top two quadrants, ideally in the top left quadrant, um, and then everything else below that should be uh, delegated, automated, or deleted. Mm -hmm. And I, sh I bring that up because I feel like there should be, like, I have a lot of like random recurring events in my calendar where it's like, once a month or once a quarter, I'll ask myself like in a recurring event on my calendar, like, am I still doing X, right? Or is X still serving me? And just kind of trigger trigger that like pause to stop and think as opposed to going a month, two, three, being like, why do I feel so blah? And then you're mm -hmm. like, oh, I need to spice things up a little bit. I'd rather catch that 45 days prior and fix it. So I guess what I would add to what you shared is having some sort of system to audit what mm -hmm. you decided to do and ask yourself, is this still serving me? Yeah. And we, so I'm a huge fan of building margin into your calendar too. And part of that white space being reflecting on at the end of the week, okay, I feel overwhelmed. I feel exhausted. I feel depleted. I'm bored. I'm whatever what happened? Like, why would that be this week? 90% of the time when I felt overwhelmed, it was because I got off of my model week. I said yes to things that I shouldn't say yes to. Mm -hmm. I added something without subtracting something else, right? For being a financial advisor and a, a physicist, I am 
bad at math. I can add, 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 and then I never take anything away. And I'm like, wow, why am I tired? Why am I exhausted? Um, and the only person that pays for that is me, right? Um, and then layering in too, on what you said with the Stephen Covey model would be adding in, and if I'm really good at it, right? I'm really good at it and I enjoy it. Is it also really effective for my business? Because there's a lot of things that I enjoy doing and I'm really, really good at, but they don't actually move the needle for me. So how can I fulfill that need or that desire? Is there a way for me to do it outside of my office in some other fashion? Or can I use it to actually move the needle within my business? So if putting together a model week is like the top thing that you would like, if you only had a, a, a quick minute to share mm -hmm. with an advisor, uh, mm -hmm. what would be number two on the list before? Because I, I don't want to just give them one thing. I want to give them two things before we hop <laughs> off. What would be the next thing that has the biggest impact on their practice and becoming more efficient? So for me, I would say it's building in time to CEO time, like actually building in time to work on the business where you're creating white space to think strategically and reflect and do all of the things that we're supposed to do. Cause we all, I, I know, and I was in this trap forever and ever. I'd be like, okay, I'm going to take this whole day. I'm going to set this whole day aside and I'm going to work on all these things. And I'm going to like take this time. And by the time that day came, I had filled it with so many other tasks that were right in front of my nose that needed to get done. Right. Like, Oh, I got to fill this with the Jones, the Jones's plan. And I got to finish this thing for so-and-so. And not holding that time sacred for myself and looking at it as kind of a nice extra or gosh, it would be nice if I had time to versus holding it sacred and using it as like a fundamental part of my calendar to actually build the business of my dreams. Yeah, I think there there's an inflection point that I see often, uh, both I've seen it in myself and um with most advisors where there's this inflection point where they get into the business, typically as the broker dealer uh, world puts it, the three I's, impact, income, and independence, right? Like that's why people generally get into this business. But then there's an inflection point that happens where it's like, oh crap, crap, I like, I'm not just an advisor. Like I have a, I have a business. I'm, I'm right. in charge oh, of, whoops. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, wait, I didn't get in the, into this to run a business. I got into this for impact income and independence and I'm having impact. And if I'm having plenty of impact, I have plenty of income, but man, I have no independence. Yeah. I can cut out early if I want to, but like I can't cause I have all this work to do. So to your point, having that CEO mindset and, and also like where I think the industry can be doing a better job because right now most of this comes from outside the industry and books and podcasts and things of that nature is running the business like a business. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, people like you and I, we could, you know, be doing an even better job sort of helping advisors run it like CEOs because uh, I don't think it's talked about enough. No. Yeah. Um, I mean, growing up in that broker dealer world, it was all of our training was on selling product placement, you know, planning, right. Being how to be a good planner, but totally lacked the skills of how to run a business mm -hmm. effectively or efficiently. So, and I know the two examples I gave are kind of time management. I guess that's where my head's at this morning. The other like super tactical thing and thinking about CEO time is anytime I'm doing something and you have the thought, Hey, you know, I just wrote an email sort of like this to, you know, Jim Smith a week ago. Let me go find it. So anytime you have that moment where you're like, I've done this before and I now I'm recreating the wheel. Like that's the moment to take the extra two minutes to turn it into a template, go find the email you sent to the guy, clean it up and actually save it as a template. And in order to save it as a template, you have to have a process or you have to have a, a filing strategy or wherever you're going to put that thing and then teach your team to use it. But in, instead of recreating the wheel, it's uh, 38 minutes a day of most advisors' time and staff's time. So 38 per, minutes per person is just finding documents online um, or recreating things that they've already created before and they just can't find them. And so then you add in just recreating stuff because you've never made the template in the first place to that. It's so much time wasted. It ends up being like five or six weeks of work if you're a 40 hour a work week person. 
And I'd rather be on the beach for five or six weeks versus just recreating emails. So I'm, I'm smirking as you're saying that, uh, particularly like, I just sent this email similar to this. I should make a template um, literally today. Okay. There were two <laughs> people and I added it to my task list of to templatize this. Um, but literally today, there are two people uh, that were, for lack of a better way to put it, um, you know, partnering up, so to speak, as it relates to, you know, our services are complementary to one another. So we can start mm -hmm. introducing, you know, clients back and forth. And similar to you and I, there is a, a little bit of overlap as to what we do, but, um, you know, where each of our expertise stops, the other one starts, you know, to a degree. So there's a lot of opportunity to further serve mine and your clients, you know, and kind of hand folks back and forth. So do you remember that email um, I sent to you a, a few months ago where it was like, hey, here's all of our services. Here's the types of clients yeah. we work with yeah. here. I literally copy and pasted that today to send it out to two other people. And I was like, I was like, this saved me a lot of time because I copy and pasted it, but I could also templatize that. So it's on my list to templatize. So it's just ironic that you brought that up and That's I happened hilarious. to take it from the email that I sent you. <laughs> yeah, today. That's so funny. Well, yeah, because that's what you sit there and you're like, who did I send that to? Yeah. I remember I had a really good thing about that. <laughs> yeah. And so having a list or an idea parking ladder where, okay, I'm going to take time. So CEO time or whatever to work on like building processes to me as part of CEO time um, or can be like, I'm going to take the time to actually just formalize that and memorialize it and call and now it's done and I know where it lives and I can use it. I don't remember, I don't have to remember who I sent it to or what I said to them um, and saving maybe two or three variations depending on who you're sending it to and be done. And now, yeah, now you get to- Yeah, as long as it has, done. like templates are supposed to get you 85% of the way there and then you right. need to add your own personal sprinkle to it depending on you know the particular person. So, um, but yeah, it was just funny that it was your email that I took <laughs> it from. Uh, <laughs> So, but I feel like I could keep talking through this stuff. And I think uh, perhaps it makes sense for us to do like a part two to this at, at some point uh, in all seriousness. So if you're open to that, I'm kind of putting you on the spot while we're on the recording that we should do that. Well, now um, I feel obligated to say yes. <laughs> well, that's, that's the point. Uh, <laughs> um, but before, uh, before we do wrap up, uh, one of the questions that I ask all of our guests as a way to distill uh, a reading list for our listeners, which um, I will say, uh, let me just uh, pull this up so I can go to the exact uh, tab. So <clears throat> so when I go to... Uh, your website, theefficientadvisor.com, and I click on Libby's favorite things. Uh, you have a whole list of books, uh, uh -huh. one of which uh, you said you'd like to just chat through briefly today. And I, I double checked. I was like, is this on, is this on her book list? And it is, <laughs> it's uh built to sell by uh, John Warlow. Yes. I okay. I'm laughing. So ironically, on my click, as so I use ClickUp for task management, and on our ClickUp for our team meeting today is talking about updating the Libby's favorite things part of our website because it is, <laughs> it's like 10 years old. Like it is so outdated, <laughs> it's so old, but that book is still one of my favorite books that I recommend all the time. I mean, literally, I bet I recommend that book three, four times a week. So, what's the so I have my SEPA designation, uh, Certified Exit Planning Advisor, for those listening that may not be aware of, of what that is. So, um, you know, I work with advisors who are looking to sell their business and making sure like I'm making these numbers up for sake of the example. But if most, you know, practices sell for say four to seven X multiple of their EBITDA, it's like, okay, cool. That's good to know. But like, how do I get seven and not four? I right. help, I help advisors with that. Um, so when I think of built to sell, my mind goes towards making sure that you're growing your business in such a way to where um, you're in a position to sell when that opportunity comes to mind. Is the title 
that obvious or am I misinterpreting what it is? No, (laughs) yes and no. I always joke that I'm going to write a very strongly worded letter to Mr. Borlow and say it should be called built to scale. Um, Uh. And because of that scale, so the book is basically, and it's really strange. It's such a weird little book, but it's written like a fiction novel and it's about how to take a service offering and standardize it, which is basically what we do as financial advisors. So how do we take something that feels like it should be fully custom to everybody and has a big customizable component? Because like you said before, I'm a big fan of like 80% template, 20% customization. Mm-hmm. And how do we get to a place where we can do that? And this book just really in a really easy to read. So especially for people who are like, I'm not a business book reader. I don't love that. This book, you can finish it in like two hours. And yes, it's all about building a, like the story is surrounding a, a gentleman who has a service-based business that wants to exit. And so it's yes, building it up to this exit strategy, but for someone who started a practice from scratch that she built to sell, right. And I did sell it. I can see how productizing my services and scaling and building a structure that could operate without me for the most part, made it significantly more sellable. So yes, it's built to sell, but I always joke that it should be called built to scale because there's so many things that advisors can take away from that immediately and start productizing their services. Understood. Yeah, yeah. Come across it before. I don't believe I've read it. I'll have to check it out, especially if it only takes a couple hours. Um, Literally, I mean, maybe two, maybe two if you're a fast reader. Yeah. Okay, so- I'll finish it in four. Um, <laughs> well, Libby, this is this has been wonderful. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, I know it's been a long time coming. I also want to say thank you for uh, having me on your podcast. And uh, I'd love to have you back. And uh, with that being said, if folks want to find you, you know, I know I, I just mentioned your website, but feel free to share that again. You have your own podcast give yourself a little commercial. Where can folks connect with you? Uh, How can they find you? Yeah, absolutely. So the podcast is The Efficient Advisor, and we have a community over on Facebook with about 2,000 advisors that are screened to make sure their advisors are operational staff in advisory practices where we share uh, uh, templates, strategies, ideas, processes, ways to do things faster, better, cheaper, smarter, or easier. And I also hang out on LinkedIn. Awesome. Well, for those of you who are listening, I think this is, uh, I know this is an episode that's worth sharing. So please do so. If you haven't yet officially subscribed, we'd love that. And if you could take a moment and uh, just give us a a quick review, we'd appreciate that. But Libby, appreciate your time. Uh, Everyone listening, appreciate yours as well. And we'll catch you on the next episode. Oh, always fun. Thanks for having me. Take care. 